Everybody, it's Tyler here at Ontario Provincials checking in with 610 Crescent Coyotes. Finalist award already this year and looking good here at Ontario Provincials. They got a really cool robot, so let's take a look at everything that Crescent Coyotes has to offer. I love this arm structure that they're bringing in. We'll be talking about a vacuum system, but something really cool too uh, that we'll be diving into is check out some of the Kirby and what they're doing on this as well in order to get some structure going as well too. So some great things we'll be talking about. Also what they're doing from a programming software side. So let's learn more about this team. Come up here on Behind the Bumpers. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the Join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Jess, so let's break down the, how you approach the Crescendo game. Uh, walk me through your robot archetype and uh, some of the cool specs on your robot. So this is our 2024 robot, Leviathan. So we are using MK4IL4s uh, for sort of modules, and we have a double drain to arm. Our arm is powered by four Neo Vortexes running at a 17 to one gear reduction, and our wrist is powered by one Neo Vortex with a 60 to one gear reduction. And the entire system can move in its range of rotation in about 0.2 seconds. And then here, our end effector is what we call a vacuum. It is an intake plus shooter, so it can intake from the ground or the source and then shoots from back here after the arm folds up. Walk me through as you're approaching the Crescendo game, what made you choose to want to go with like this kind of all-in-one arm structure? So when we were thinking about the game, we first came up with a needs and wants list. So we knew that speaker and amp would be almost equally as important. So we wanted a robot that can just as effectively score amp as shooter. We also wanted to be able to effectively shoot over defense. So this arm structure gave us a perfect geometry for all three at the time. And let's start to move on and talk about uh, some of the other parts of this robot here. Evan's going to be talking about the uh, wrist uh, joint that you have. I think that's one of the really key features of your robot as well, too. Uh, and then I'll be going into the uh, pivoting and how that all works. Yeah, uh, so this is the wrist joint, my personal favorite uh, part of the robot. Um, the main feature is that the wrist joint in our flywheel shaft is actually concentric. So as you can see, our wrist spins on uh, this axis here, which is attached to gussets attaching to our arm. Uh, it spins on an aluminum tube, which is hollow and has a 0.75 inner diameter, uh, which allows the half inch hex shaft for our bottom flywheel to spin within it. Um, so if we just trace the power, we can start at the gearbox with the reduction, and then we go through a set of idlers, which allow for a transport position. And then we uh, come to this sprocket. Uh, this is the small, smallest sprocket for number 25 chain we could find on McMaster car, uh, because we need to shoot notes out here, right? So nothing can be too big. That's also why we use number 25 chain. And then the power is transferred through set screws into the aluminum tube, and then more set screws into gussets, uh, which go into our vacuum and allow it to rotate um, in independently from our, uh, the revving of our flywheel shaft. Can we see uh, just a general demo of how some of that movement works on your robot? I know we'll be talking to some of the states later, but let's just see how this uh, overall uh, smoothness of this yeah, uh, robot sure. is. So looking really good on there. Um, as I said, we'll be talking about some of the states for it later as well too. But Alex and Jonah are going to be talking about uh, this intake structure that you're using as well too. So walk me through on this. Uh, you know, we've got some cool iterations from the past as well too and then what you have now. So let's go through it and talk more about it. All right, so as for the intake, this is the front of the robot where we receive the note from either the ground or the source. This is a uh, one inch outer diameter polycarb and we've been hit multiple times this whole year. Has not broken once. So it's been working out pretty great. And the tape that we use for grip is those anti-slip tape that you use on the ground. And they actually haven't fallen off or anything. So those are also excellent. So that's for the intake. But the key feature of our vacuum is this distinctive U-bend. So this U-bend allows us two things, to maintain our proper intake geometry and to also take a hit without permanently bending or snapping or deforming anyway. So this is actually our newest addition. It, the material is called UHMW, and we've tried a bunch of previous iteration, iterations with polycarb, different, bunch, uh, different materials like aluminum, and you can see with the polycarb version, you can see the damage that we received on the back end. And so that, uh, that was uh, simply something that we needed to iterate on. And so we had this version, that version, and then we had a version where we bent it using this custom jig that we made. So it starts, yeah, Evan, you could demonstrate if you want. 
it starts with this straight, and we just use a heat gun to heat it up a bit, and now we can use that lever to bend it into the proper shape. Now that uh, didn't work as well as this because we, we just tried all of the materials and this had just the best effect. So that's our final iteration and has been working amazing. We have not broken a single time this competition. And so that's for the structure of the vacuum. Do you want anything else to add in regards to your intake? Sure, I was just going to talk a little bit about the aspects for uh, pit crew and how easy things are to replace. So with this first module, this was from our first week of competition and as you can see, lots of screws, lots of things to replace and come out, sort of like our V1 intake. It's covered in screw holes, not super easy to access. So we ended up swapping these one, two, three, four pieces for just a two piece. So we beefed up the aluminum in the back so it's never gonna bend again like Oh, so it's never gonna bend again like this. And we've added only one bend into this one uh, piece of button. Yeah. This whole uh, structure is just really, really cool as you go through. I love hearing about the different iterations that your team has gone through to make this happen. How would you say uh, here at Provincials, is it working to your expectations so far? At Provincials, we've been the most consistently performing that we've been all year. So I'm personally really happy with, with uh, how we've been playing individually, yeah. Let's talk. Let's talk some of the programming side as well too. Math is going to be going more into uh, that vacuum that we've been talking about, how that works, and also your autonomous modes as well. Yeah, so our vacuum, we only have one sensor, but this one sensor does everything that we need it to do. So right here we have a brake beam and it goes right along here. It has two states. It is either broken or not broken. So if we have a note and we have intake the note into the vacuum, the note will now be breaking the brake beam sensor, which tells us in code that we have a note. And so once, and when we are ready to shoot, what we actually want to do is pull back the note a little bit as the note would touch the flywheels when we are revving the flywheels up to speed. So we do this by spinning the intake motor the opposite way, but then we only spin until the brake beam is no longer broken, thus telling us that we have left the area where it would touch the flywheels. And this allows us to know when we want to shoot. The brake beam also tells us when we've intaked a note off the floor or from the source. And it also really helps in autonomous because in autonomous, we can drive until we have intake the note, which we know through the brake beam, or until a timer has been reached saying give up on that note and move to the next note. And in autonomous, we also use Path Planner to do some path finding, which means that say we want to go for a center note, we have the option of if I didn't find a note in that area, I can move to the next note using pathfinding depending on where I am now. So it makes us more dynamic, it makes us more reliable, it gives us more options uh, depending on the situation that we're in. From a Talia standpoint, can we demonstrate a couple of little states of uh, putting the note in and walk you through how those work again? Yeah. So. so this is our intake position. And once the note is sucked into the vacuum, it breaks the brake beam, which is how the, uh, the robot knows when to lift the note back into the transport position. If we head over to the amp shooting position, you can see that we pulled back the note until the brake beam is no longer broken, and this means that we are able to rev up the flywheels, and now we are able to shoot the note. Very smooth, very efficient process that you've gone through on there. David, let's wrap up uh, talking about a little bit more about the arm as well too. Uh, and then uh, also how you're uh, utilizing your limelights and anything else from Swerve you want to talk about. Yep. So um, I'm just going to talk about arm first. So a cool thing in my opinion that we do is we store the robot state in an enum. And essentially what that means is we have constants for some presets that we have as well as constants for the shooting speed. And rather than applying it to different places like in different methods, we can use it in one method by passing it in an enum, which makes the process a lot easier. And what we do for Limelight, I think it's pretty cool. So we first have Z targeting to the um, input tag, as well as having a linear equation for both the rev speed and also the arm, the, the wrist, in order to adjust based on distance. And we calculate the distance using um, some trigonometry equations that we develop, developed. And in terms of Swerve, we use the Yaxel library since that gives us a lot of easy debugging steps, like Advantage Kit, and also works very well with Pass Player, like Matt just mentioned. Last thing I want to ask you, uh, just from an uh, aesthetic side, you got kind of these cool dragons on the side of your robot as well, too. Uh, walk me through uh, just uh, what that means to your team. 
So at the beginning of the year, when we first started designing our shooter, we realized that looking from the front, uh, can we flick down? So looking at uh, from the shooter side of the vacuum, our uh, a vacuum looks a lot like a dragon. And the idea was that this is the mouth of the dragon. And once we shoot a note, it's like it's breathing fire. So that's where we came up with these cool dragon plates and why we wanted to call a robot Leviathan. It's a pretty badass guy. So congratulations on a phenomenal season so far. Good luck here at Provincials. And thanks for taking time to tell us more about your team. A lot of great things that our teams can learn. And we can't wait to see how you do. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the Join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support.